Good morning. I'm actually honored and humbled to be here and to be included among the list of uh, speakers who have delivered this lecture before me. Uh, I would like to thank the EPD for giving us an, a tremendous platform to project and disseminate the results of our work to the professional community. I'd also like to thank TMS for providing us with a community that has absolutely no shortage of mentors, role models, and uh, colleagues and peers who are of the highest caliber. Uh, they have been an inspiration for me, they have challenged me, and uh, they have uh, uh, driven me to, to work and to try to uh, push the boundaries of our field. So today I'm going to talk about the solid oxide green technology for metals production. Uh, we have been actually working on this technology for the last uh, 10 years, and the folks who have contributed in terms of students, postdoctoral fellows, and collaborators are all listed over here. And I have also acknowledged the federal sponsors who, ha who have uh, uh, sponsored uh, this program uh, in the last 10 years. So if initially here is an outline. So first I'm going to start with the need and uh, describe the process and its applicability. I'm going to show how the process is used for magnesium production, silicon production, aluminum production. I'll describe the process signs. And then I will list the different types of metals that have actually been produced using this process. At the end, I'm going to summarize and try to demonstrate the universality of the process for producing metals from their respective oxides. So this process is actually best used for producing energy intensive metals. What exactly do I mean by energy intensive metals? These metals ha are less electronegative, which means that they, are, they form very stable compounds and it is very difficult to reduce or to dissociate these metals from the compounds. And it needs uh, large amounts of energy and has a lot of detrimental environmental impact. So here are some of the applications that these metals uh, have. And to start, uh, we have the light metals, magnesium and aluminum. They are mainly used for structural and transportation applications. Then we have the rare earth metals, uh, neodymium, dysprosium, ytterbium, so on and so forth, and they are used for uh, magnets and lasers for a variety of applications. We have semiconductors that are mostly used for electronic applications, and then we have specialty metals like titanium and tantalum that are used for uh, high strength and for corrosive resistance. And the applications go actually all the way for all these uh, metals from automotive, aerospace, information technology, defense, mass transit, energy, and medical devices. Now, if we look at the state of the art metals production flowchart and look at the value chain going from ores to finished products, the most energy intensive step is the reduction of the metal oxide to metal. And there are different ways one can accomplish this. One, one is carbothermic, which means that one would use carbon to reduce the metal oxide, or one could use another metal that is less electronegative to reduce the metal oxide, or one can convert the oxide to a halide and then electrolyze the halide or use a less electronegative metal to reduce. And these are all very energy intensive processes. They involve 
multiple unit operations like raw material preparation, smelting, refining, uh, and because of that, it has high capital and operating cost, and at the same time, they all generate large amounts of greenhouse gas emissions, hazardous emissions that include uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, uh, fluorocarbons, etc. And at the same time, uh, they also generate solid and liquid hazardous waste. In response to this challenge, uh, we have come up with an innovative approach for metals production. It essentially uses a solid oxide membrane that conducts oxygen ions to reduce the metal oxide and directly produce the metal at the cathode and oxygen gas at the anode. And this process, in comparison to the state-of-the-art metals production, is one unit operation, is less energy intensive, less capital intensive, has zero carbon emission, uh, it creates oxygen as byproduct, and this oxygen is very pure, and it can also be sold in the market. Uh, it uses non-consumable molten salts to dissolve the oxide, which means that the salts can be reused. In essence, this is a green technology. So here is a schematic of the process. So the heart of the process is this yttria stabilized zirconia, or stabilized zirconia, which at temperatures over 900 degrees centigrade, it conducts oxygen ions. So one side of this membrane is we have the inert anode, and on the other side of this membrane, we have a molten salt or a, or a halide flux, which dissolves the oxide that we would like to reduce. And in this salt, we have a cathode, and a potential is applied between the cathode and the anode, when it exceeds the dissociation potential of the metal oxide, the metal is reduced at the cathode, the oxygen ions that migrate through the membrane and is oxidized at the anode. Uh, there are two key innovations. One is the inert anode assembly, and I'm going to be talking about that, and that is actually universal, which means that it can be used for any metal oxide reduction. The molten flux, it is actually uh, specific to the oxide being reduced, and we have some requirements for this flux. Now, before we get to this innovation, what I would like to do is show you a process animation that would describe the, the process uh, uh, in an animation. So here we have the membrane. It is one enclosed yttria stabilized zirconia tube. And on the other side of the membrane, we have the molten flux in which the oxide is dissolved. And inside the tube, we have a thin film of molten silver. And uh, at this temperature, silver oxide is not stable, so uh, it does not oxidize. And so the oxygen that is oxidize evolves as a gas. For example, uh, when we apply a potential, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which is greater than the reduction potential of the oxide, the metal gets reduced at the cathode, and the oxygen ions that migrate through the membrane, and they get oxidized in the silver. So the oxygen that is oxidized actually comes out as oxygen gas. The innovation here is a current collector as well. And in the current collector, you have a contact which makes a, makes a contact with the silver. And this contact is strontium doped lanthanum manganite, which is electronic in an oxygen environment. So it can conduct the electrons. And connecting this strontium doped lanthanum manganite electronic uh, oxide is an incarnate tube, which is much higher in electrical conductivity, and joining these two is a pool of liquid silver. Now, this electronic oxide, the strontium doped lanthanum manganite, is positioned with an aluminum paste, and the whole 
The fixture, that is the liquid silver and the incanel, is encased, is encased in an alumina tube. So although the incanel is oxidation resistant, but obviously in pure oxygen is going to oxide, so it's going to, it, it's going to oxidize, and therefore to protect the oxidation, we have the alumina tube. So this is the inert anode. So I'm going to go back, and now I'm going to talk about uh, the engineering the molten flux. So what the requirements of the flux is that it needs to have low electronic conductivity, as low as possible, high ionic conductivity to lower the ohmic resistance. Uh, it should be greater than two to three Siemens per centimeter. It should have reasonable oxide solubility to lower the mass transfer polarization, and also to lower mass transfer polar polarization. It should have low viscosity, less than 0.1 pascals per second. It must have low volatility because we don't want to change the composition of the flux. Uh, the volatility should be less than one microgram per centimeter square per second. And the most important is that the flux has to be stable with the zirconia membrane. One criteria for engineering the stability of the flux is, uh, um, is to make sure that the optical basicity of the flux that is used matches with the zirconia, and that is a good starting point for the stability of the membrane, designing the stability of the membrane. So here is uh, the process for magnesium production. We have a steel container which contains the flux, and the steel container actually acts as a cathode. We have the anode which is in the form of a tube, and you have the liquid silver here, and the inert anode current collector here. The magnesium oxide is dissolved in the flux here, and the potential is applied between the cathode, which is the steel crucible, and the anode. When it exceeds the dissociation potential of magnesium oxide, magnesium gets reduced at the cathode and oxygen bubbles out of the anode. We do this uh, electrolysis at around 1150 degrees centigrade, so the magnesium that comes out is in the vapor form. And that magnesium actually goes through this exit, and uh, here I've shown that the exit leads to a condenser where we can condense that magnesium depending on the temperature gradient in the condenser, we can either collect the magnesium as a liquid that can be cast, or we can collect it as solid granules. So here uh, is the inert anode current collector. I have already talked about this, but you can look at uh, the uh, actual um, physical um, picture of the inert anode current collector is shown over here. It's quite robust. So if you, if you want to analyze the process, we can do that with an equivalent circuit. And I'm going to talk about the equivalent circuit in the next uh, slide. So here I have the same equivalent circuit. And uh, for example, in this system, the steel crucible, if you have uh, some iron oxide, it will dissolve in the flux, and iron oxide, and iron is more electronegative than magnesium, so as we are increasing the applied potential between the cathode and the anode, the first oxide to reduce is going to be the iron oxide, which is shown over here. So once we exceed the dissociation potential of the iron oxide, the, the iron gets reduced, and we follow this uh, circuit out here. We have charge transfer resistance at the cathode and the anode. Then we have mass transfer resistance at the cathode, which involves migration of the iron ions. And we also have uh, uh, resistance associated with oxygen evolution at the anode. Then we have the ionic resistance in the flux, the ionic resistance in the membrane, then we have 
the resistance associated with the current collector and the leads. So these four, the leads, the current collector, the membrane, and the flux, they're all ohmic. And uh, I'm going to show you that initially, uh, as we apply a potential sweep, we are dissociating the iron oxide, which is shown by this blue curve out here. And so what we would end up doing is apply a potential which is slightly greater than the dissociation potential of the iron oxide. That way we can clean the flux of all the iron oxide. So once all the iron oxide is reduced or removed from the flux, we can then increase the potential and we can see that the next oxide that gets reduced is magnesium oxide, which is shown by the red uh, trace out here. So we are applying a potential with measuring the current, and this is the dissociation potential associated with the magnesium oxide. So here is the Nernst potential of the magnesium oxide, the charge transfer uh, resistance associated with the cathode and the anode, here you have mass transfer associated with the cathode, which is mass transfer resistance associated with the migration of the magnesium ions to the cathode. And then we have uh, also the resistance associated with oxygen nucleation and evolution at the anode. We have ionic resistance in the flux, in the zirconia, and again the current collector and the uh, leads and the contacts. So what we can do is we can now look at how we can analyze all these potential drops. And that can be done with this equation where all the potential drops across each one of these resistance elements are shown over here. So this is the Nernst potential associated with the dissociation of magnesium. The ohmic potential drop is associated with the ionic resistance of the flux, the membrane, the current collector, and the external resistance. And this can be measured with the impedance spectroscopy. And, uh, and this is associated with the charge transfer resistance that is taking place at the anode and the cathode. So this is the polarization resistance, which is written in terms of the exchange current density and um, the exchange current density is simply a function of the uh, catalytic activity of the electrodes. And here I have the mass transfer resistance or the polarization associated with the mass transfer at the, at the cathode. And you can see that here we do not see any diffusion limited current. So the polarization drop associated with mass transfer resistance is negligible. So the, the, the other polarization is the oxygen evolution at the anode, and this is given by this expression. So in order to model this, uh, this curve out here, we have only two unknowns, which is the exchange current density and the um, partial pressure of oxygen required for bubble nucleation, and that can be done by curve fitting and we would get the exchange current density and the oxygen partial pressure for bubble nucleation. And if we use these values, we can model this trace. So I have flipped the axis out here. I have the applied potential now in the y-axis, and along the x-axis, I have the net current. So if you look at the losses, the most of the losses are, are happening because of the ohmic polarization, which means that it is due to the resistance of the flux and the resistance of the membrane, the current leads, and the external resistance. We do have some charge transfer polarization associated with the cathode, and that is shown over here. So one can actually model this process. Now, once the magnesium starts to evolve, what happens is that the magnesium gas, um, it starts to dissolve in the flux. Although the solubility of magnesium in the flux is only around 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 atom percent, but it gives rise to an electronic conductivity in the flux. 
When you have an electronic conductivity in the flux or the electronic resistance in the flux starts to decrease, the potential drop across this segment decreases and the potential drop across the zirconia starts to increase. And when this potential drop across the zirconia increases and exceeds the dissociation potential of the membrane, the membrane begins to dissociate. So one has to really look at the solubility of magnesium in the flux and how one can mitigate this electronic conductivity. So here what I've done is I've used the same equivalent circuit and I have shown that one can actually measure the electronic resistance of the flux by monitoring the transference number in the flux, the electronic transference number in the flux. And as the, as the magnesium is produced, the electronic transference number, as indicated by this red uh, dots out here, the electronic transfer number you can see is increasing uh, until at some point it becomes uh, stable, which only indicates that the magnesium that is evolving as a gas, a small portion of it is dissolving in the flux, which is giving rise to electronic, uh, uh, electronic uh, conductivity. And you can see when that happens, the efficiency decreases because under these conditions, the zirconia also has electronic conductivity. And so there is a leakage current which results in the efficiency dropping as the trans electronic transference number increases. So as the electronic transfer number increases, the efficiency as shown by here, it seems to decrease. Okay. So, we can analyze this. So what we'll do is uh, we are going to use this loop out here and the loop out here going through the zirconia, the electronic resistance in the zirconia, which is shown over here. So we know from the modeling exercise, we know the charge transfer resistance, the ionic resistance. In fact, we know the ohmic resistance and the charge transfer resistance. So we can actually uh, determine the maximum potential that we can apply for zirconia dissociation as a function of the electronic resistance in the flux and electronic resistance in the zirconia. We can solve the system of equations and we can show that as the electronic resistance in the flux increases and the electronic resistance in the membrane decreases, the maximum applied potential for zirconia dissociation increases. So this is what we really want so that we can get high current. So we really should be able to apply as high a potential as, as possible without dissociating the zirconia. So here you can see that as the electronic resistance of the flux increases and the electronic resistance in the membrane decreases, the the ionic current increases, which is a measure of the magnesium production rate, and it is possible because the maximum applied potential um, increases. So in, in effect, what we really need is a high electronic resistance in the flux and a low electronic resistance in the, in the zirconia membrane. That's going to make the membrane stable. It will give us high current efficiency and high production rate. So how can we do this? So one way we could reduce the solubility of magnesium in the flux is uh, by performing this reduction at lower pressures. Uh, and the other approach is as we do the electrolysis, you can see here that the magnesium is coming out as a gas, but a small portion is going into solution. So what one could do is uh, here I have shown that if you stop the electrolysis, so if you break the circuit, and if you short circuit the, oops, if you short circuit the anode and the cathode such that this anode then functions at the, as the cathode, and the electrode in the flux functions as an anode, the oxygen gets reduced, and the magnesium that is soluble in the flux gets gets oxidized. 
and that creates an electron blocking layer which increases the electronic resistance of the flux. So one modification that we can suggest in the, uh, in the design of the cell is that we have two tubes, zirconia tubes. One is used, to, used for the electrolysis and around that tube we have a steel cage and we can short circuit this cage with, a, with another tube that contains an oxygen saturated silver such that all the magnesium that is soluble around this cage is going to oxidize and it will create an electron blocking layer around this membrane. And with this approach, we have been able to sustain a very high current efficiency on the order of 80%. Okay, so now um, if, we, uh, if you look at uh, the electrolytic current, as the magnesium oxide concentration decreases, the electrolytic current decreases. This is uh, with an applied potential of around four volts. And here is the, uh, the, uh, the cell or the reactor uh, at the end of the run. This is magnesium collected in the condenser uh, as a solid. And here we have uh, an EDAX of the magnesium because it is condensed from the vapor phase. It is uh, very pure. We get about four nines in purity. And here is the cross section of the membrane as received and, and after the experiment. And the membrane seems to be relatively stable. And these runs we have done in the lab for more than a week with continuous feeding of magnesium oxide and the membrane uh, uh, is, uh, is, is, is quite stable. So here is a scale-up design proposed by Infinium and uh, of, the, of the magnesium uh, solid oxide membrane process. So here is the zirconia membranes that you see. It contains the anode and here is the cathode so the magnesium that comes out as a vapor f in the vapor phase upon, upon reduction uh, goes into the condenser where it is, it is condensed. Uh, and one could get liquid magnesium that can be tapped uh, into, into ingots. And here you have uh, feed uh, through which magnesium oxide can be continuously fed. Now, here I have a comparison of the solid oxide membrane process um, with the other state-of-the-art processes uh, in terms of dollars per pound and the cost comparison involves uh, the capital cost, the material cost, the energy cost, the labor cost, and other operating costs. Here is the electrolytic production which involves electrolysis of magnesium chloride. This is the uh, metallothermic process, which is uh, the pigeon process. This is the carbothermic process using carbon to reduce magnesium oxide. And this is the solid oxide membrane process that I just described. And you can see that in terms of the cost, this appears to be the most cost effective. And this analysis was done uh, independently by Sujit Das at Oak Ridge, and the reference is listed over here. Uh, similar uh, benefits can be seen uh, uh, in the environmental front. Uh, if you look at the CO2 evolution, the chlorine evolution, the sulfur dioxide, and the energy consumption, the gray area, it, it uh, uh, corresponds to the metallothermic process, the pink, it corresponds to the electrolysis, and the yellow, the solid oxide membrane process. So you can see that the CO2 generation, the chlorine and the sulfur dioxide and energy consumption are significantly lower for the solid oxide membrane process. So now uh, switching gears, I'm going to describe uh, briefly on the silicon production process using the solid oxide membrane. Here, instead of uh, having the metal reduced as a vapor phase, the metal is reduced in a liquid tin cathode. So here um, I have the same anode, the yttria stabilized zirconia with the inert uh, silver and the current collector. And um, 
As far as the cathode is concerned, we have liquid tin here, and we have a bubbling tube and a, and a, and a secondary cathode to remove the impurities. So you can see out here that um, as we apply a potential sweep between the cathode and the anode, when it exceeds the dissociation potential of the silicon oxide, silicon gets reduced, and when the silicon gets reduced, it goes into, the, goes into solution in the tin, and the oxygen comes out as a, as a gas. So, this, so here is an electrolytic trace of the, of, of the current, and uh, the way the process works is that once the silicon starts to go into solution, if you look at the phase diagram of silicon and tin, at temperatures over, say, around 1350, um, you can dissolve about 95 atom percent silicon in the tin. So a lot of silicon can be dissolved into the tin, and uh, if you cool it by, say, 200 degrees, if you control the rate of cooling, you can avoid constitutional supercooling, and you can cast the silicon as an ingot by directionally solidifying out of the tin. And uh, uh, here I have shown you some of the silicon crystals that uh, we have made. So that depends on the rate at which you cool the silicon tin alloy. So one can get directionally solidified silicon ingot, or one can get uh, silicon chips of, of different sizes. So here is uh, uh, the, uh, the EDAX analysis of the silicon. So we are in the process of analyzing the silicon for impurity. The advantage of this process is that, okay, I'm going to talk about the impurity in the next slide. So the advantage of the process is that we can uh, purify the silicon in two different ways. One is by having a secondary cathode that is going to reduce the more electronegative uh, cations like iron, titanium, phosphorus, and the boron that we have, because we have a fluoride flux, the boron will actually evolve as boron fluoride and it's going to leave the melt. Um, and if you don't exceed uh, the dissociation potential of the alumina and calcia, they are going to stay in the flux while we reduce the silicon. So we can actually get um, um, uh, relatively pure silicon into the tin, make the silicon tin alloy, but when we are um, uh, solidifying the silicon out of the tin, the impurities will get further partition between the silicon and the tin. And you can see that the impurities will generally, if you look at the partition coefficients, they are less than, they are less than a fraction. So most of the impurities are going to stay in the silicon tin alloy, and the silicon that we get is re relatively pure. So, so this is an ongoing project, and we are trying to get um, purities that are better than the solar grade silicon. So here is uh, the membrane, which is uh, uh, after a run for 27 hours. You can see the cross section uh, below the flux. It is shown over here. And uh, if you look at the cross section, here is the atria stabilized zirconia membrane, and here is a flux. Here is a magnified image. And you can see that the membrane is relatively stable. And if you can look at the oxygen and the yttrium content, and they appear to be relatively uniform, indicating that there is no diffusion out of the membrane. And also the fluorine is uh, uh, mostly in the flux, and there is no diffusion of fluorine into the membrane. So the membrane uh, holds up to the flux that was designed. Uh, so one could also think of using uh, liquid aluminum as a cathode, and one could then um, use a lower temperature for the reduction. One could uh, do the reduction at 900, and the silicon is going to go into solution in the liquid aluminum, and the different products that can form in the aluminum uh, 
can be analyzed out here. So the purification can be similarly done as I have described for the silicon. So here are some of the advantages of the process. Now if I compare with the state of the art process for silicon, so you start with raw sand, you have a carbothermic reduction process that produces the metallurgical grade silicon and then it is upgraded by chlorination, distillation, then thermal decomposition. So all these are very complex uh, uh, multi-step process and that adds to the cost. The solid oxide membrane process directly produces silicon from silica and if you are able to sell the oxygen that is produced as a valuable byproduct, then you can further get a cost advantage. So this, uh, the, the cost out here that I have listed is a moving target. So the thing to really look at is the difference in the cost. It's really an order of magnitude difference compared to the existing state of the art if you're able to scale up this process. So um, with the, the next one on the list is, uh, is aluminum. Uh, the, the aluminum here, the flux that we are using is, um, is shown over here. Uh, here we are, we are collecting the aluminum as, as a liquid because the aluminum that is reduced is lighter than the flux and it floats up. So we have the flux here, we have the anode, we have a reference cathode or we could have a secondary cathode out here and, and this is the primary cathode, and this is an expanded view of the cathode, and you can see that to prevent the aluminum from sh shorting between the cathode and the anode, we have an aluminous sleeve which is dielectric. At the same time, it serves as an alumina source that uh, it feeds into the flux, and once we reduce, we can reduce aluminum directly into the liquid aluminum cathode. And the, and the contact is, is the titanium diboride. And here you can see the potential sweep and it shows the dissociation potential for aluminum oxide. The aluminum that we have been able to produce to date is, um, is over 99% pure. So the, this is an ongoing work. Uh, so here I have listed uh, the different metals that we have produced using the solid oxide membrane electrolysis. So we have produced lithium, magnesium, calcium, titanium, uh, tantalum, iron, copper, aluminum, silicon, dysprosium, and iterbium. So with this, I, would, I hope I have been able to convince you that this is a process the solid oxide membrane-based electrolytic process is a green technology that can reduce any metal oxide to produce the metal at the cathode and pure oxygen gas at the anode. Thank you.